here. So we're going to talk about documenting the plan A. And so just to set a little bit of context, because I think it helps to understand the example I'm going to present, is I'm going to talk about one of my products called Cloudfire, which was a um, file media sharing uh, product. Now, prior to Cloudfire, I'd built this file sharing product called BoxCloud. And I'll, the only context I want to set is that the value proposition around BoxCloud was simple file sharing. So we had built this technology. Um, so I mentioned before how I started the company around this vision, the spark of an idea. And so for me, it was really, it was really a, the, the classic um, entrepreneur looking for a solution type of a company. I had this vision around building this innovative, disruptive technology potentially and build this platform first. Um, had a product idea in mind. That was the one I built in Stealth. Didn't quite work. And so I went searching for other uses of that technology. And so BoxCloud was one of the, the products that had, had some success. And then Cloudfire had even more success after that. But the, the fundamental value proposition there is that we, were, we allowed people to share very large files without any uploading. And so I'm not going to talk about how it actually worked, but that was what we were able to do. And so here I was interested in taking what I'd done at BoxCloud, which was geared more towards businesses and see if I could build a more consumer-facing or more media-sharing uh, application. So rather than doing things that just files and folders, try to do more media, photos, videos, music. So that's the only context I'll set. Um, so in the process that we're going to talk about, the first step, so when you first start out, you have an inkling of a potential problem in your mind. You might even know who the customers uh, are or will be. It's worthwhile to actually brainstorm other possible customers as well. And so I talk about distinguishing first between customers and users. And so the distinction is very simple. Customers pay for your product, users do not. And it's, it's, it's sometimes not even that obvious for some kinds of businesses. And some, you have your users and your customers to be the same. So if you are doing any kind of a software as a service, typically you'll have a, a freemium or a trial process where you have users and not yet paying you. You convert them into paying customers. So there your users become your customers. But when you have multi-sided markets, so even looking, thing, looking at things like Google Search, um, there your users are not, um, but over there your, your, your customers are not people like you and me doing the search. We are actually users of the system. The real customers of Google are the ones that pay them, which would be the advertisers, people who are doing um, either, either paying for ads or, or, uh, or using the AdSense, things like that. So those will be their real customers. So it's important to have that distinction because we want to be very customer-centric. That's where the business model really comes out from. The other thing we want to do is split these customer segments into smaller ones. So this is a concept of finding the early adopter, but also finding that initial niche or initial um, beachhead, as Jeffrey Moore likes to call it. Um, and the reason we want to do that is that it's very hard in the earlier days to try to market to everyone. While we all would like to build an app like Facebook, which you know 500 it was a million plus people use. Um, even Facebook started out with a very, very specific early adopter uh, customer in mind. And that was a, a, a college student at a Ivy League campus, and not just any campus, but Harvard. And, and the way they even rolled that out was, 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 um, was, was very um, incremental and going after Ivy Leagues first, and then companies, and then eventually everyone, because they really wanted to build those beachheads with those customers. And I can talk about this a little bit later on, but. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few things here. But if you look at even Facebook's story, they weren't the first to build a social network. They were like number 11 or 12. But they managed to build the largest social network that we, we know of uh, today and the most successful one we know of today. And part of the reason can be attributed to the fact that they were so focused. And unlike other social networks at the time that were really more about growth, they were really more about how many, how many friends can you have, they were really more about engagement in the earlier days. And so by actually creating a much smaller space where the people who were using the social network on Harvard were not people who were strangers to each other. Many of them knew each other, but they kind of had a back channel to create networks to be able to talk to people, to be able to talk about their friends behind their backs. And that created high engagement, created a whole platform of conversation that has still grown. So the, the most fascinating thing about Facebook is that even in the earlier days, they had phenomenal growth. Like I've seen numbers where when they launched the campus, by the end of the month, they had three-fourths of the campus on Facebook. They had such phenomenal growth. Uh, but even more interestingly, they had very high engagement. People were using it every single day. There was, not, uh, there was not a day that went by where people weren't logging into Facebook. And to me, those two are like the, the kind of the magic thing that Facebook was able to demonstrate at even small scale. And then scaling that up is kind of where we are today. Yeah, question?
Sure. So, the movie. right, <laughs> it's it's. I I think there's some very obvious ones um, that would probably in the mind. So I mean, a, everyone who was building building that kind of a business would want to mon would would look at the asset being the number of users, yeah. and then at some point being able to monetize that asset either through advertisers or you know, there, there are many different ways you can do it: premium memberships or whatever that ends up being. But the point with their with their story is that they were not interested in necessarily nailing down who that customer was, it doesn't mean that you still don't know who they may potentially be. Um, and that's a different model also. Like the business models that I will talk about, I guess the specific one is more of a user and customer being the same, and so we are gonna be charging them, so we wanna charge them up front. But in a business model like Facebook, where the engine of growth is, is built more on uh, the number of users, or it's built more on, 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 a, on kind of a multi-sided market, there you have to first establish the marketplace. So you have to first establish the user base. And as I was reading the book, that was where I kind of fell. We got stuck with dealing with any of these models because I mm -hmm. didn't get all the reach between customers and users. Mm -hmm. The people who are expecting to pay for the service are not, are not the users. You know, they're, they're, I mean, the people that I'm actually going to sell this to right. are not the people I expect to be kind of getting off the system. Right. And again, so even there, like I would say that there, there are many good hacks to actually go test that out. And so if you were, so Facebook is a different example, which is a really long play. Like they took many years of raising a lot of money, losing a lot of money before they turned it around. Um, but even if you were doing a much smaller play, say you were, you were, you were really building a marketplace where you were trying to get buyers and sellers, um, one of the, um, the, the, the patterns or a good hack there as well is to try to increase the, cohes the, the cohesiveness of the marketplace. So again, rather than trying, if you were, say, say you were listing sporting goods, um, you had a marketplace for sporting goods, rather than trying to list every possible sporting good and having one in each category, just pick one that people are more willing. So again, finding your early adopters of both sellers and buyers and put them together in a more confined place. Try to make that model work, demonstrate value there, and then see how you grow that into other categories. So that's a case of of still like identifying who customers are, but then still narrowing down to uh, to kind of a smaller segment. So can you describe how you would use the, the lean startup canvas differently when you've got a multi-sided market area? Sure. So there, there are kind of two ways. I, I would say that initially, like I still recommend people just put everything on one, um, because sometimes even multi-sided markets have a very clear path. Like in the Facebook example, the value proposition to the advertiser is pretty well known. If you can, if you can give me a targeted audience of you know a thousand people, I'll pay you money, right? So I don't necessarily have to build a whole canvas just to to, to illustrate that. It's pretty pretty well known. Um, but so I, I would say if you just started with one, that's that's okay. But if you find out that the value proposition is changing, so in this in the sporting good example where I do have say a a retailer and I've got someone who is into saying playing golf and I want to connect the two of them, the value proposition might be very different. The channels might be very different to reach them. Um, so at that point, I would split the canvas into two separate ones. And then in the tool also, we, we implemented a hashtag feature, which I'll I talk a little bit about later on. But if you, um, you it, it gives you the ability to actually annotate parts of the canvas and hide them. So you can still put everything on one. Um, so next to a particular field, if you put the hashtag and you, you, you label it as buyer and seller, and you use that throughout the canvas, then you'll have a button that you can click and hide things away. So you can still keep everything at one, but that's just a use of the tool. But I would, but the point there is that it, it does make sense to split them out and see the value propositions from both sides, if, if, if they are different enough. So doing the first one will, will let you realize that, and then you split them out. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a Yeah, th that's a good question. So someone had asked me a question about the kind of the Osterwalder canvas, and w one of the things that I find there, I mean, it's a great, it's a very great book. It's actually built in a, you know, it's built in research and, and has a lot of work in, uh, that's where his PhD came out from. It wasn't, I think, his original work. He actually picked it from someone else. So there's years of work that's gone into it. <clears throat> but one of the things that I find is that it tends to tackle the business model from many different angles. And it's more, um, there's a lot of emphasis on brainstorming for that optimal, <coughs> Example, and I think after a while you start of, you basically start getting diminishing returns because you can, you, um, you know, it's, for me it's the whole practice versus theory kind of trade-off. So I personally like to time box um, how much time you spend on the canvases, and to me, like spending more than an afternoon is is too much. Like I would spend an afternoon to get the initial canvas out, and in the lean startup world, we are we are very much about action. So we want you to really get out of the building 
go start testing some of those things. If you are blatantly wrong, come back and then update the canvas. But don't spend, don't spend three days in a workshop or five days in a workshop just looking at every possible variation of that canvas. So I, I, I do have a kind of a difference there where I do like to kind of time box it and make it be more action driven than, than, be, um, than be something that you just in, spend a whole lot of time doing. And the idea there, again, is looking at this as a living document. You always are expected to come back and, and maintain it. So it's not, it's not important to get that, per, that, that perfect document to start with, but the initial brain dump of what you think is in your mind, kind of get that out there, see where the holes are, and then go fill those gaps and come back and update. But, but for a minimal, uh, minimum viable product, is your goal to get down to one canvas? No. Okay. No. So even with this example, as I'll, I'll kind of walk through, I came up with four potential customer segments, yeah. and I pursued two for a very long time. Okay. And so, so, so this point we talked about already is that for every one of these customer segments, we'll sketch, sketch multiple canvases. And looking at this specific example of Cloudfire, which was this file media sharing product, Obviously, the, the, the category that I would like to be is go after anyone that shares large files today or large, large media files today. And that is just too broad. I, I, don't even, I wouldn't even know how to market a product like that or where to necessarily start. And so some more specific examples that I listed out were folks like photographers. I already had a product which was, which was doing file sharing for businesses, more files and documents. So looking at photos for photographers was an example. Looking at video for videographers. Um, this was an example of scratching my own itch. So this was back, this was about five or six years ago when iPhones were just coming out and there was all this media, like we had iTunes, we had all this media. And so I was trying to build a product where we could share this across all devices. And now there are many products in the marketplace, but that was what I, what I meant by the media consumers, which was more build something um, that would allow you to access your music, photos, videos from any device, anywhere, as long as you have an internet connection. And then the final one, which seems a little bit out of place, but it also has this personal context, was looking at specifically parents with young kids. And the reason I kind of highlighted that one, and that's the example we're going to use, is that five years ago I had my first child, and I had this file sharing product. I really wanted to do number three, but I witnessed firsthand how my wife was struggling with, with photo and video sharing. And I thought that was a problem that was, was solved. I mean, there was so many alternatives out on the marketplace, but she still was unhappy with with all the alternatives out there and was still complaining about uh, not being able to share stuff. And so I decided to explore that one a little bit further. And that's the example I'll, I'll share here, because that is one of the, 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 the segments that I pursued. And I'll talk about the other one here in a little bit. 